There are two kinds of people in this world. People like me who debate nerdy theological topics like republication, and people who have a life. What's up guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft where I build this big church in Minecraft while talking about Christianity, and I'm once again working on my university today, I'm calling it Vermigli Theological Seminary. And speaking of theology, today we are discussing a very deep, nerdy theology topic called republication. It is so, like, esoteric and nerdy that it is only a debate within the Reformed Presbyterian Church. So if you're not, not a Presbyterian or, or Dutch Reformed, which is just the continental European equivalent of Presbyterian, this debate is not directly relevant to you, but I still think it's interesting. So, republication is a debate within covenant theology. So, covenant theology is basically the reformed understanding of the Bible, the reformed hermeneutic, which means method of interpretation for the Bible. We think it's the biblical way to interpret the Bible, the way that the Bible interprets itself. So, covenant theology doesn't simply mean having a theology of the covenants, because we all know that the Bible uses the language of covenant a lot. Covenant theology specifically says that the entire story of redemption, from Adam all the way until Jesus, has been an unfolding of the one overarching covenant of grace. Why does that matter? It means that the covenant God made with Adam, meaning the promise God made to Adam, and the promise God made to Noah, and the promise God made to Moses, and the promise God made to David, and the promise God makes to believers in the New Testament, are all part of the same overarching covenant of grace. And that means there's been one covenant people consistent throughout all of redemptive history. So the Israelites, that's us, that's the church. It's the same group of people. Whereas some other people, a lot of modern evangelicals believe in dispensationalism, which says that modern day Jewish people are the continuation of the Israelites, but covenant theology says that Christians are the continuation of the Israelites because God's covenant people have always been whoever trusts in God's covenant promises. And the Jewish people as a whole, that wouldn't apply to them because Jewish people do not necessarily believe in the Messiah. I mean, I know there's some that do. I mean, I'm part ethnically Jewish, so you could say I do in some sense, but there is nothing about being Jewish that makes someone one of God's people. God's people are, are the Christians. That's what covenant theology believes. And covenant theologians aren't the only ones who believe that. Like, Lutherans and Reformed Baptists would agree with covenant theology that the church is the continuation of Israel from the Old Testament, but they still wouldn't believe every aspect of covenant theology. Reformed covenant theologians are the only ones who believe in the continuity of the covenant of grace from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Um, Reformed Baptists sometimes have their own form of covenant theology called 1689 Federalism, which agrees with covenant theology that the church is the continuation of Israel, but disagrees with covenant theology because it still says the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, meaning the Old Testament and the New Testament, are different covenants. And you can't blame them for thinking that. Lutherans also think the same thing. You can't blame them because, you know, it is that the word New Testament implies a, a new covenant, implies a different covenant, but we think it's really just a new administration of the same overarching covenant of grace. Now, we believe all the covenants laid out in the Bible are administrations of the covenant of grace, but we also believe that running parallel to the covenant of grace is the covenant of works. So whereas a dispensationalist who thinks that God makes different rules for different time periods um, divides the Bible more into like vertical chunks of time, covenant theology sees two horizontal covenants like train tracks that run parallel to each other. A Presbyterian pastor with a YouTube channel named Matthew Everhart put it really well. Dispensationalists see the covenants as like dominoes, where one replaces the other, whereas covenant theology see them as Legos that build on each other. And I think that's brilliant, and I've used those illustrations myself because of how brilliant it is. I'm not sure if you thought of that, but either way, it's that's a very good way to describe what covenant theology is. And so far, I haven't even gotten to the debate. I haven't even gotten to the disagreement about republication. So there's the covenant of grace, and there's the covenant of works, and there's also the um, the covenant of redemption, which is the 
deal God makes within himself, the three persons of the Trinity agree on which group of people they're going to save, but that's not entirely relevant to today's topic. If you go to my video a few videos back, Why I'm Not Amaraldian, there I talk all about the Covenant of Redemption. But today, we are talking mainly about the Covenant of Works. So, God made the Covenant of Works with Adam in the Garden of Eden, and Adam represents all of humanity, so God made the Covenant of Works with all of humanity. And the rule is, if you obey, you will live, and if you, if you disobey, you'll die. The rule God made to Adam was, if he obeyed, he could eat from the tree of life and live forever. But if he disobeyed and ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then he would die. And Adam and Eve both failed the test. They both failed the covenant of works, and all humanity sinned in Adam, so all humanity deserves to die. So the, under the covenant of works, we deserve to die. But the covenant of grace means we simply just have to believe in the covenant promises, which in our case is, is Jesus. Um, Jesus is the covenant promise. But even in the Old Testament, before the Jesus the Messiah had come, people were saved just by trusting in God's covenant, covenant promises. So we believe that salvation was always by faith alone, even in, in the Old Testament, because the, the covenant of grace was still present in the Old Testament. So the covenant of works says you need to actually obey God to be saved, and all of humanity has already failed that, so all of humanity deserves judgment. But Jesus came and basically fulfilled the covenant of works by being the perfect person that none of us could be. So then the covenant of grace means we just need to believe in Jesus to be saved. And that's why Reformed theology, even with all our covenant theology, we still believe in, in salvation by faith alone, because obviously there's no contradiction there between covenant theology and salvation by faith alone. Now, what is republication? So we already said that the covenants in the Bible, the covenants with Adam, covenant with Noah, covenant with Moses, Abraham, they're all part of the covenant of grace. But the problem with that that some people have recognized is that the covenant God makes with Moses, when God gives Moses the law, there seems to be a big works principle there, because God is literally giving Moses the law. And that's kind of why Lutherans and Reformed Baptists think that the covenant God made with Moses was not the covenant of grace, that the covenant God made with Moses was the covenant of works. That's what Lutherans and Baptists would say. And republication is still adhering to the Reformed idea of covenant theology. Republication still says the covenant with Moses was a covenant of grace, but it tries to compromise and say that in some way the covenant with Moses was also a republication of the covenant of works. Republication means the, the covenant of works is sort of being delivered once again through Moses. Now it does make sense because Moses was literally given the law and Protestant theologians have always talked about the law-gospel distinction. Um, Lutheran theologians talk about it the most, but all Protestant theologians in general have recognized there's a law-gospel distinction. And the law basically says, here is what you need to do. And the gospel says, here is what Jesus has done for you. The law says do, and the gospel says done. And because of that, Many Reformed theologians have said, okay, well, maybe the law is just synonymous with the covenant of works, and the gospel is just synonymous with the covenant of grace. And if that's the case, if you try and perfectly have a one-to-one -one correlation between the law and the covenant of works, and then the gospel and the covenant of grace, the logical conclusion of that is saying the covenant of Moses was in some way a republication of the covenant of works because no one can deny that there was a big law aspect of the covenant with Moses. No one can deny that at all. That's impossible, because it is literally called the law. The first five books of the Bible are called the Torah, which is the Hebrew word for law. It's undeniable. Now, people like me, however, who disagree with republication, what we will say is there is not necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation between law and the covenant of works. We would admit that the covenant God made with Moses certainly was a presentation of the law, but we would say that that does not mean it's a republication of the covenant of works. So what's the difference between the law and the covenant of works? The law basically says, here is what you have to do. But 
the covenant of works is a bit different than simply giving rules. The covenant of works says you will have eternal life if you obey the law. So the fulfilling the covenant of works is obedience to the set of rules. So the law doesn't necessarily mean covenant of works if there's not this idea that you need to actually follow the law in order to have eternal life. And in the covenant God made with Moses, God did present the law to Moses, but it's not like God says you will have eternal life if you obey these laws. Even in the Old Testament, even in God's covenant with Moses, God always rewards the people when they worship God and punishes the people when they worship false idols. So what that means is that it's still based on faith. It's not based on works. When God punishes people in the Old Testament, it's not due to them breaking the laws by not being kosher enough or not making sacrifices the right way or wearing the mixed fibers, even though the law did command them to do those things. God only punishes his people in the Old Testament when they worship false gods, when they have a lack of faith. So to me, that indicates that even the covenant that God made with Moses, even though it had a big law aspect to it, that doesn't make it part of the covenant of, of works. Because, the first of all, the Bible never uses the language covenant of works. Every covenant that is actually called a covenant in the Bible is just part of the covenant of grace. Covenant of works is simply a category that Reformed theologians invented to try and describe the relationship that God has with all of humanity in, in general. And that's what theologians always do. Like the word Trinity, for example. The Bible never uses the word Trinity. That doesn't mean the Bible doesn't teach the doctrine of the Trinity. It's just that the Trinity is the best explanation for what the Bible does teach about God. Because the Bible does indeed absolutely teach that um, God is one, that there is only one God, but that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, and the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. So theologians coined the word Trinity to explain that reality, but it's not like the doctrine of the Trinity was completely made up. Similarly with the, the Covenant of Works, the Bible doesn't use the term Covenant of Works, but Covenant of Works is a category that theologians have made to describe the relationship that God has with all of humanity. Because the Bible does say that God, in some sense, demands obedience from all humanity, but it also says that all of humanity has sinned and fallen short. And sin wouldn't mean anything if there wasn't some agreement where we had to not sin, if there wasn't some deal that God made with humanity collectively to not sin. So the covenant of works basically is just the deal, the, the promise, the covenant that God made with all of humanity, demanding that humanity obey. But all of humanity disobeyed in Adam, and it's not like the disobedience was a one-time thing. It caused humanity to fall into a state of original sin, where humanity is unable to not sin. It's like, if you think you have the free will to not sin, then just stop sinning. Try it right now. For the rest of your life, never sin again. Can you do it? No, of course not. That's why we need the covenant of grace. And the covenant of grace does not require us to keep the law perfectly. It simply requires us to have faith, to have faith in Christ. And that's why there's the whole Protestant doctrine of salvation by faith alone. Okay, so why does the republication debate matter? Why does it matter whether the covenant God made with Moses was... Um, a mixture of the covenant of grace and covenant of works, or whether it was just purely 100% covenant of grace with no part of the covenant of works at all. Why does that debate matter? Well, it is really important to uphold the continuity of the covenant of grace. My personal biggest reason for affirming covenant theology is so that the Old Testament can be relevant to us today. And the Bible says that all scripture is relevant to us. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16, I believe, says that all scripture, and when 2 Timothy was being written, the only scripture there really was was the Old Testament, at least formally speaking. All scripture is God-breathed, profitable for teaching, and training in righteousness. However, and I, I know that all Christians would affirm that. I don't know of any, like, faithful Christian who would say, oh, we can just totally throw out the Old Testament. But the more of a discontinu discontinuity 
you make between the way God worked with people in the Old Testament and the way God works with people now, the more discontinuity there is, the less profitable the Old Testament is for us. So that's why it's important to affirm that the way God related to Moses and the Israelites in every aspect except the outward administrations is essentially the same as the way God works with us today. That's what covenant theology tries to assert. So we would admit that the outward administrations are different. Like we don't have the temple system, we don't have the sacrificial system, but the core of the relationship God had with people back then is the same as it is, is now. Like we don't have the temple sacrificial system, but we still have the same sacrifice now as we did back then. Because even back then, the sacrifices of the animals never actually removed their sins. It was always the sacrifice of Christ that removed their sins. And the animal sacrifices were just like a ritual that symbolized that and in some way um, gave them that reality. But that, the only difference was the outward administration. That's why we say that um, there's all the sacraments, the sacraments are like the religious rituals, are made up of the sign and the thing signified. So the signs are different in the Old and New Testaments, but the inward thing signified is the same. Like, uh, the best example of that is baptism and circumcision. We're Presbyterians. We believe in Reformed theology. We believe in Covenant theology. So we believe that baptism does today exactly what circumcision did in the Old Testament. The only difference is that we have a different sign right now. And Baptists don't baptize babies because they don't believe in Reformed Covenant theology. Um, I would say Reformed Baptists don't believe in Reformed theology at all, except for like predestination and maybe something about eschatology. So they don't baptize babies because they see a discontinuity between the Old and New Covenants. Baptists will say that in the Old, in the old Covenant, uh, I should move these cows over here so I'm not treating them cruelly. I don't support animal cruelty on this Minecraft server, except I'm kind of a hypocrite because I eat McDonald's burgers, so I'm kind of supporting animal cruelty in real life. I think this is a complete tan tangent and side note, not related at all to what I was saying, but it's important. I think Christians do need to be concerned with animal rights in some sense, because although animals don't have the right to life the way humans do, God still cares about animals and we shouldn't treat them cruelly, so we should support, you know, ethical farming and stuff. Anyway, that was a complete tangent. That uh, I was just inspired to say that because uh, I saw I was treating my Minecraft cows not the best. Anyway, so it matters that we have a continuity between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant because we know they're part of the same covenant. And I believe that republication, while it's a valiant effort to try and explain away the law principle in the covenant with Moses, republication interrupts the continuity of scripture. Because uh, one of the biggest theologians who holds to republication is R. Scott Clark, and he's quite good in other ways. Um, he's part of the Escondido School in California, that seminary. But something he said that I found kind of disturbing was, Everything that is unique to the covenant with Moses is completely abolished in the New Testament. It's like, dude, what? If you think that, if you're being consistent and you think that everything unique about the covenant that God made with Moses is abolished or abrogated in the New Testament, that would include the Ten Commandments. Because we have to remember that the Ten Commandments are part of the covenant God made with Moses. And we know that the Ten Commandments are still things that apply to us today because Jesus himself referenced the Ten Commandments a lot. So, um, and that's also, by the way, why Reformed people, especially Presbyterians, are one of the few Christians who still take the Sabbath seriously. Um, I didn't actually know this until recently. Maybe I'll make my next video about this, but um, Presbyterians are one of the only people who still believe in the Sabbath and that the Sabbath is on Sunday. Some other Christians will say like, oh, the Sabbath is on Saturday, and some Christians will be like, oh, the Sabbath has been abolished because really Christ is our Sabbath or something like that. But Presbyterians have always said that the Sabbath has been moved to Sunday ever since the resurrection, and we, the fourth commandment, still applies to us. It doesn't make sense to say that all the Ten Commandments apply to us today except the fourth one, and somehow we're we're freed from the fourth commandment. We still have to obey all the other ones, though. That simply doesn't make sense. And I know that you shouldn't do your theology, you shouldn't construct your theological doctrines based on what makes sense. But seriously, do you really think that God would tell us to keep all of the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament except one of them? Seriously? No, of course not. But anyway, uh, so... 
the important thing about covenant theology, the thing covenant theology has always stood for, was the most strongest continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament, between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and republication, like I said, seems to interrupt that. Also, republication um, is, I see it as a concession to other non-reformed traditions, because in most cases, it's kind of interesting, in most cases, if you put the different Christian denominations on a scale, Reformed theology falls in between Lutherans and Baptists on most things, like the Lord's Supper, for example. Lutherans insist that um, the bread is objectively the body of Christ. Christ is present in, with, and under the bread and wine. And Baptists say it's completely just a symbol. I know there's some Baptists who will say it's more than a symbol, but let's be real, most of them say it's just a symbol. And Reformed theology says, oh yeah, Christ is present in the Lord's Supper, but we receive him spiritually, not physically. And it's the same thing with baptism. Uh, Lutherans say that baptism saves uh, without qualification. Baptists say that baptism does not save. And Reformed people say baptism does save, but only for the elect. So on most issues, Presbyterians are somewhere in between uh, Baptists and Lutherans. But on the issue of covenant theology, I've noticed that Reformed Baptists and Lutherans basically believe the same thing. They both believe that the covenant God made with Moses was just works, was a covenant of works. And that it's not like they believed people were saved by works back then. Both Reformed Baptists and Lutherans have ways of saying that um, the sacrifice Christ made still applied to the people back then. So I'm not accusing them of believing salvation was by works in the Old Testament. But still, Presbyterians and I guess other truly Reformed groups like the Dutch Reformed um, Presbyterians are still the only ones who completely uphold the continuity of the covenant of grace. So republication, which sort of admits that the covenant God made with Moses and was in some way a covenant of works, or at least a republication of the covenant of works, it feels like a compromise with uh, the Lutheran and Baptist traditions. But I think Reformed theology to uphold the coven the continuity of the covenant of grace needs to reject republication. Um, I'm not saying that people who hold to republication aren't truly reformed, because there are good arguments that you can make, and there's debates over whether or not the, the Westminster Confession supports republication, and it's hard to determine that because the debate on republication is a very modern one, so it's hard to determine whether the Westminster Confession, which was written hundreds and hundreds of years ago, um, which side Westminster took. It's hard to determine that. And sometimes the people who believe in republication uh, be will accuse people who don't believe in republication, like me, of not thinking that the covenant of works exists at all. And that's not what I think. I do believe the covenant of works exists, but I just don't think any of the covenants that are actually called covenants in the Bible are part of the covenant of works, because I think that the covenant of works is more of a theological construct. And just because it's a theological construct doesn't mean it's not true. Like I said for the Trinity, the word Trinity was coined by theologians, but we still believe the Trinity is, is biblical because it's the only way to explain the nature of God, which scripture reveals to us. All right, guys, that's about it for this episode. Like I said, this is a very nerdy episode, but this is a, just a brief explanation of why I reject the doctrine of republication, because I want to uphold the continuity of all of Scripture, because all of Scripture is just the one overarching covenant, the one overarching plan of God's salvation that points to Christ. All right, I'm going to speed up the rest of this video while I keep working on the seminary, and I'll see you guys later. Bye.